Okay, so now we're gonna start the topic of selective and differential media. And I'll tell you, every single semester that I've taught, and I'm up to like, what, like 32 semesters now, um, this is a topic that microbiology students find, like it seems like either students get it completely or they don't get it at all. Okay, so one thing I wanna tell you, if you make it through this lecture and you're still like, what the heck? You're confused. There's nothing wrong with you. You are not alone. Okay, so this may be a topic that I have to go through multiple times. Um, and if you guys have suggestions about how I can make this more clear for you, I've, I've tried to do it in a way that to me is, is the most logical, but if you have suggestions like, hey, AIM, I'm just not getting this, um, please do not hesitate to, to let me know, tell me in lab, or you know, send me an email or a remind text. Um, I just wanna make this you know as simple as possible. So that being said, don't panic, okay? And if I have to do, you know, multiple quizzes or maybe a take home homework um, to get you to understand this, then that's what we'll do. You know, unfortunately, there's not a lot of questions about this um, on mastering, so I can't give you that type of assignment. But, um, you know, when I give you a quiz, we'll see how everyone does. And if the class as a whole does not do very well, that tells me that, okay, we need to go back and go over this. So this video too, you're also gonna see posted in two places. It's gonna be under the unit two lecture video. But then when I upload lab six, which you'll do you know, in a couple weeks, the next time you come back to lab, at least lab group one, cause you finished uh, your gram stain, first gram stain lab this week. Um, this is what you're gonna set up for lab six. So lab six is over selective and differential media. Okay, so you're gonna see this, um, this video pop up in two different places, just so you know. Okay, so to review, when we have grown up bacteria in labs so far, we have used really kind of generic media, okay? It's, you know, what I refer to as an auger plate. You know, this is what you put your environmental samples on in lab two. And the technical name for it is TSA, which stands for triptych soy auger. It just means that it has some soy protein. Um, you know, it is, it's super generic. And we use it because all, pretty much every single species of bacteria loves it. Um, so gram positive, gram negative, you know, the weirdo mycobacteria, um, you know, different types of fungi will grow in here, like yeast cells, pretty much every microorganism loves it. Okay, so it's a way to grow up things really generically. However, we use selective and differential media when we want to try to narrow down the species of bacteria that are growing. Okay, so one example that you'll see when we talk about the 10 species in the gram stain lab is there are two different species of staph that you look at, staph aureus and staph epidermis. Well, they look pretty similar on agar and they look identical under the gram stain. So how can we tell them apart? We can't do it by using a gram stain, right? So selective and differential media are, oh, it's a very useful, easy way for us to basically tell if something is a certain type of bacteria and um, if it is a certain species, simply by looking at the agar and you don't even have to do a gram stain, okay? So that's the use of it. So when we talk about selective and differential media, it means that we are gonna add two separate components to the agar um, to make it selective and differential. So the first component I wanna talk about is what makes the media selective, okay? So, when we define selective media, selective media is where we're gonna add an, ing a, an ingredient to the agar, which will let only certain types of bacteria grow. And what I mean by type is a gram type and a shape. 
Okay, so remember in lab, we're not dealing with spirals, right? Because those cause sexually transmitted infections. So you're gonna look at gram positive or gram negative bacteria. And then in terms of shapes, it's gonna be cocci or rods. So basically we're gonna add something to the selective media and it's gonna let one type of bacteria grow and it will inhibit or prevent growth of all of the other types of bacteria. Okay, so here are the four types uh, that of bacteria that I'm talking about. We have gram-positive cocci, gram-negative cocci, gram-positive rods, and gram-negative rods. Okay, so there are four types, and when we add something to make media selective, it's gonna let one of these types grow and then the other three can't grow at all, okay? And feel free to prove this to yourself in lab, you know, if you wanna, you know, take something and do a quick gram stain, I swear to you, it's true, okay? The other thing that I want you to, you know, either write this down or circle it on the PowerPoint, when we make media selective, it is always a salt component, okay? So it may be, you know, a weird kind of salt, but what makes media selective is it is always salt, okay? Always salt, that's important. So we are gonna um, have two different types of um, selective and differential media that you're gonna work with in lab six. Um, now realize there are hundreds of types of selective and differential media, okay? It can test for a ton of different stuff. And if any of you decide to go on to med tech school or what is called now a clinical laboratory scientist, you will have to learn all of those, okay? For microbiology, we are gonna learn two types. So the first type of agar that you're gonna work with in lab and in lab six is called mannitol salt agar, which we abbreviate M-A-S-A. -A. And this is kind of nice because everything you need to know is actually in the title, okay? So it has mannitol in it, um, which is a type of sugar, and it has a lot of salt in it, okay? So right there, it tells us it has a bunch of salt. That is what is going to make it selective. Okay, so mannitol salt agar, we're gonna add very high levels of salt and just, you know, sodium chloride, your basic table salt. So. You know, the typical amount of salt that goes into your regular media that you've been using, your regular agar plates, is I think about, eef, I wanna say like 1% or something like that. Mannitol salt agar, it's gonna be about 7.5%. So it's really salty. Okay, when we put in a very high level of salt, this makes mannitol salt agar selective for gram positive cocci, okay? So basically nothing else but gram positive cocci is going to grow on mannitol salt agar. Um, so gram negative rods, nope. Uh, gram positive rods, nope. Gram negative cocci, nope. Um, all of those will be inhibited. They're not gonna grow. So this kind of makes sense in terms of what we're looking for. Okay, so a lot of the bacteria on your skin is gram-positive cocci, like Staph aureus and like Staph epidermis. Um, and those types of bacteria are what we call halophiles, okay, which you learned about in chapter six, right? Those are bacteria that like a lot of salt. So it makes sense that they would be able to grow on mannitol salt agar. Okay, and because of that, the type of infection that would be best to examine with mannitol salt agar is a skin infection, like an abscess, okay? Remember how I mentioned in the lab bacterial species PowerPoint how Staph aureus is really pathogenic. So when you get an infected paper cut or a hangnail or a, you know, a cut or a scrape, normally that's Staph aureus that's causing that. Um, even though Staph epidermis is all over your skin as well, it's not very highly pathogenic. So if it gets into an open wound, chances are nothing's gonna happen, okay? So normally 
when uh, a skin abscess culture is sent to the lab, they're gonna plate it out on mannitol salt agar, and they're gonna look to see if it could be caused by staph aureus. Okay, so that it's, uh, the answer to this is a skin infection. Okay, so file that away. That's mannitol salt agar, okay? Agar type number one. The second type of agar you're gonna be looking at that is selective and differential is called Makanki agar, which we abbreviate M-A-C. So um, unfortunately, this doesn't tell you a lot, okay? Makanki agar is named for the guy who invented it, basically, Dr. Makanki. Okay, and now, now remember, we're adding salt to make it selective. However, it's not just typical table salt in high concentrations like mannitol salt agar. Here, we're going to add bile salts to the agar, okay? So um, bile salts are salts that are isolated from the body fluid bile, which is produced by your liver, travels through your gallbladder, if you still have a gallbladder, into your small intestine. And it basically, you know, helps to emulsify um, lipids so that they can be absorbed by the small intestine, okay? So when you add bile salts to something, you're basically trying to simulate um, an intestinal environment, okay? Or, you know, anything that could be um, connected to the intestine. So when bile salts are added to a media, it makes that media selective for gram-negative rods, okay? So, yep, gram-positive cocci, not gonna grow. Um, you know, bacillus subtilis, which is a gram-positive rod, that won't grow either. Um, but any type of gram-negative rod will be able to grow on McConkey agar because you've added bile salts, okay? So basically, the, the other three types can't grow, only gram-negative rods will grow. So um, because we're trying to simulate kind of an intestinal environment, um, you could use McConkey agar, for example, if uh, the person is having colitis, they have some type of intestinal infection, that could be one place to use. However, the most common infection that McConkey agar is used to diagnose is actually UTIs, or urinary tract infections. And the reason for that is that most UTIs are caused by E. coli, okay, which is a gram-negative rod that is commonly found um, in the intestinal environment all through your colon. Um, but when E. coli, usually from the person's own body, makes it into the urethra and then potentially up into the bladder, that is what causes UTIs, okay? And UTIs caused by E. coli, much more common in females as opposed to males, simply because of the differences of our anatomy. So, you know, the rectal environment is much closer to the urethra in, uh, or the opening to the urethra in females as opposed to males, okay? So yeah, if you've ever had a UTI, chances are it's probably caused by E. coli, usually um, from your own body. Okay, so that's the selective part. So the take home message, you have two different kinds of media, uh, mannitol salt agar and McConkey agar. What made them selective was the salt component. In mannitol salt agar, it's a high concentration of salt. In McConkey agar, it's the addition of bile salts. Okay, so now let's move on to the differential part. Okay, so remember, we've already selected for a particular type of bacteria. Now we wanna be able to tell the different species of that same type apart. Okay, so once we have selected for a certain type of bacteria, you know, let's say gram-positive cocci in, the, in terms of mannitol salt agar, gram-negative rods when we're talking about um, McConkey agar. Okay, now we want to tell the different species apart. Okay, so how do we tell the difference between Staph aureus um, and Staph epidermis or Micrococcus luteus? Okay, gram-negative rods, 
how do we tell E. coli from Klebsiella pneumoniae, from uh, Proteus mirabilis, and some of the other species of gram-negative rods? How can we tell those apart? So we're going to add a second component to the auger that makes it differential, and this allows us to tell the different species apart. Okay, so whereas adding salt made the media selective, adding a sugar component is what makes it differential and allows us to tell the different species apart. Okay, so let's go back to mannitol salt agar. So remember, it's selective for gram-positive cocci, okay? And we talked about this, of gram-positive cocci species, which of the species most often causes infections, you know, which is kind of our bad boy, and the answer is Staph aureus, okay? Staph epi, not very pathogenic. So here's how we can tell them apart. So to make it differential, we are going to add a sugar to the agar, and in this case, the sugar is called mannitol, and it's simply a simple sugar. And how we can tell them apart is because Staph aureus can ferment Manitol. Ferment basically means the bacteria can eat it, okay, and produce waste products. So Staph aureus can do that, but Staph epi can't. Micrococcus luteus can't do that either, okay? That's one of the other 10 species that you're looking at in lab, okay? So we use that to our advantage, and we are going to put an indicator dye in the media that will allow us to tell whether the bacteria that is a gram-positive cocci is able to ferment or eat that mannitol. Okay, so the indicator dye is called phenol red. Now, keep in mind, that is just an indicator basically of waste products. It doesn't make the media selective or differential. It's just kind of a, um, you know, a component that lets us see a color change. Okay, so, but however, phenol red is going to change color if fermentation products of mannitol are present, okay? And the only reason that those fermentation products would be present is if the bacteria growing is Staph aureus. And the nice thing is that the color change is not subtle at all. It is a definite big time color change. Okay, so when you come into to lab to do lab six, which will be in a couple of weeks, when you see mannitol salt agar at the beginning of lab, it's gonna be a nice kind of cherry red color, okay? And what will happen is if Staph aureus is growing on it, it is going to turn that nice cherry red color to a bright yellow, okay? So the reason this happens, remember, is because Staph aureus can eat or ferment mannitol and it's the only species of gram-positive cocci that can do that. So when it eats the mannitol, it then metabolizes it and it produces some waste products and the red dye that we've put in the agar that make it that nice cherry red color is going to detect those waste products and it will then turn bright yellow. Okay, so let me show you an example of what this looks like. So when you come into lab, you are gonna see um, you know, uh, this nice cherry red color, okay? And what this plate has is it has the two main species of Staphylococcus inoculated onto it. You don't see um, individual colonies, but when you see these little lines, trust me, the bacteria is growing, okay? So Staph aureus, or I'm sorry, Staph epidermis, it's gonna grow on mannitol salt because it is a gram-positive cocci, okay? And that's what it's selective for. However, because it can't eat mannitol, it doesn't cause the media to change color. Staph aureus, on the other hand, look what happens. It grows because it's a gram-positive cocci, but then it causes the media to turn a very vibrant, bright yellow. Okay, so this makes it really easy for the person in the lab because they don't even need to do a gram stain. If something is growing on mannitol salt agar, it means that it is a gram positive cocci. And if it turns yellow, it means it's staph aureus. Boom, done.
All they have to do is look at it with their eyeballs and they can tell. If it doesn't turn yellow, yep, then it could be Staph epi, it could be Micrococcus luteus, you know, it could be any other number of species of gram-positive cocci, and then you have to go do more tests, okay? But since Staph aureus is the main bacteria that causes infections, this is a really easy, fast test to tell us if, if we have Staph aureus growing, okay? So if it turns yellow, it's Staph aureus. Um, if it doesn't turn yellow, but it's still growing, then it's a gram-positive cocci, but it is not Staph aureus. Okay, so we summarize it this way. So mannitol salt agar is selective for gram-positive cocci, and that's because of the addition of lots of salt, and it is differential for Staph aureus, meaning that we can look at that agar with just our eyeballs, not under the microscope, and tell whether that species of gram-positive cocci is 100% Staph aureus or 100% is not Staph aureus, but is some other type of species of gram-positive cocci. Okay, here's another example. This is a mannitol salt plate. So here, there's nothing on it. It's kind of that nice cherry pink, um, you know, or cherry red color. Staph epi, it's growing, but it doesn't turn it yellow. Staph aureus, however, turns that auger bright yellow. Okay, so now let's go back to McConkie auger. So McConkie agar, remember we added bile salts and the main bacteria that we're gonna try to diagnose with this and the main cause of urinary tract infections is E. coli, okay? So we wanna test to tell us just by looking at the agar 100%, is it E. coli or is it not E. coli, okay? And it's the same concept. So we're gonna add a sugar to the agar called lactose, which is basically a milk sugar. Um, you know, maybe some of you, unfortunately, are lactose intolerant, okay? So, you know, unfortunately, you know what lactose is. So E. coli can ferment or eat lactose, and guess what? No other gram-negative rod can do that. So we're gonna use that to our advantage. So now we're gonna add a little crystal violet, okay? As, and we're gonna use it as an indicator dye. And it's the same crystal violet that you use in, in gram stains. And this is also going to change color in the presence of fermentation products. Meaning if that bacteria can eat lactose, we're gonna be able to tell. And guess what? E. coli is the only species of gram negative rods that can eat lactose. Okay, so the way we can tell this is colonies of E. coli are going to appear bright pink, okay? And it's because E. coli can ferment or eat lactose and no other species can. So this is a little different because the agar itself is not going to change color. It's actually gonna be the bacterial colonies, but it's a super easy color change to see. Is the bacteria hot pink? Yep, then it's E. coli. Is the bacteria not hot pink? Well, then it's not E. coli, and it has to be some other species of gram-negative rod. Okay, so here's an example. Here is a McConkie plate. And McConkie agar, when you first see it, it's kind of a maroon color. Um, you know, it's definitely not hot pink. It's just, I don't know, it's, it's a little more subtle, kind of a um, burgundy maroon shade. But when E. coli is growing on it, look at these colonies, okay? The bacterial colonies themselves are bright pink. And E. coli is the only gram-negative rod that is going to have that appearance on McConkie agar. Okay, so here's an example. So Pseudomonas originosa, okay, which you haven't seen yet, but you're gonna see the next time you gram stain um, when you come to lab. Um, if we grow Pseudomonas on McConkie agar, it do, the bacteria does not grow hot pink. Only E. coli is going to grow hot pink on McConkie agar. So once again, Super easy, you can look at the agar with your eyeballs. 
if something is growing, you know it's a gram negative rod. And if it's hot pink, 100% it's E. coli. If something's growing and it is not hot pink, 100% it's a gram negative rod, but it is not E. coli. Oh, sorry, didn't mean to thrust my hand in there and scare you. Okay, so therefore, to summarize this, McConkie auger is selective for gram negative rods because we add bile salts, and it is differential for E. coli because we are adding lactose. And E. coli is the only gram negative rod that can ferment lactose, and so the colonies of E. coli are going to appear bright pink. Okay, so like I said, you may need to watch this multiple times and take notes. Um, I think it'll be helpful maybe if there's a way for you to print the selective and differential media PowerPoint and take notes on this. Um, I think that could be really helpful, but don't panic if you have to watch this a couple of times, okay? So remember, this is also gonna help us when we do lab six, which is where we're gonna use these two types of media, okay? Thank you.